I'm Shane Morris with the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. We've talked a lot recently on the Breakpoint Podcast about religious freedom. How do we live out our faith in the public square in a society that is increasingly hostile to Christianity? This is an especially acute question for Christian business owners, especially with the growing support for sexual orientation and gender identity laws. Today on the Breakpoint Podcast, John Stone Street talks with Michael Shero, president and CEO of the C12 Group, the nation's largest network of Christian CEOs, business owners, and executives. Here are John Stone Street and Mike Shero. Welcome to the Breakpoint Podcast. Excited to invite my friend Mike Shero, who's president and CEO of the C12 Group. We'll talk a little bit more about what that is and what that means. But we're going to talk about religious freedom, faith in the public square, all kinds of those sorts of things. Mike, it's great to have you on the Breakpoint Podcast. Great to be with you. So uh, here's what I appreciate about you, all right? And this is the only time I'm going to compliment you in the next 20 minutes. So you better take it and you better like it now. Uh, Is this being recorded? This is actually being recorded, but uh, I will deny it till my death. No, I'm just kidding. Look, you know, there are a lot of kind of professional religious liberty folks talking about religious liberty right now, and rightly so. Uh, professional communicators. I'd put kind of myself into that crew. We care about these things. We know that they matter. I think you've made a big difference, Mike, when you kind of jumped on as someone representing the business community, which is what C12 does. You work, uh, and I want you to tell us about C12, but you know, there's an authenticity, I think, to what you're bringing to this conversation. And there's a lot of pastors, I think, a lot of Christians who just aren't really willing to kind of step out there until religious freedom in the church is threatened. And, uh, you know, I think you've rightly realized, look, it's not just what happens behind the pulpit. It's uh, for the people in the pew as well. And so, I, first, I just want to say thanks, because I think you've actually made a big impact. Well, thanks, John. I'm going to record that and play it at night when I'm getting criticized by others. I'll listen to your comforting words. <laughs> oh, you never get any criticism. I can't believe that. No, I'm just kidding. Tell us a little bit about C12 before we get going too much further. Sure. So it's an organization I I get the privilege of lead now for about three years. It's been around for 27 years, but it serves Christian business owners and CEOs uh, around the U.S. primarily and now in Asia and South America. But it helps Christian business owners really live out the gospel in their business. So grow great. We say build great businesses, but do it for a greater purpose. And, you know, I think the reason part of why we get involved on things like this, we serve a couple thousand guys and gals, all different companies is the Great Commission isn't how do you get the city to show up at church on Sunday. It's how do you get the church to show up in the city on Monday. Right. And so we're really about helping those saints live out businesses that honor God and proclaim the gospel. And, yeah, it's a high-stakes game. And I'd say this is the church. It's the church deployed, right? It's, it's the church living out what happens on Sundays, Monday through Friday. And we get to do it primarily in the unchurched arena. So yeah, it's a – powerful kind of expression of the gospel. Well, I think it wasn't it Billy Graham who said that the next great movement of the church was going to happen through business leaders. It's kind of been his MO for a long time, right? I mean, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob are all kind of business guys. Um, <laughs> the language of Jesus, most of his parables were- Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Did you just disagree formally with Billy Graham? I just want to point that out. I think that's what you just did. I think you just said Billy Graham didn't quite get this one right. It's easy to argue with people when they're dead, right? Because they don't fight back. <laughs> Not Billy Graham. I still think you lose that one. But anyway, keep going. I, I appreciate the point you're making. Yeah. So I think it's nothing new. I think it's fairly old. And you know, most of Jesus' work wasn't done in the synagogue and temple. It was done every day during business hours. And so part of what I appreciate this religious liberty discussion is keeping the door open. Now, I don't put my hope in it. So I think I also bring a... Um, a pragmatism. I'm in Malaysia this summer where we've got groups where it's a federal crime to talk about Christ in the marketplace. Wow. Yet they, I remember talking to this woman CEO who said, well, I'm not going to deny Christ just because the government says I can't do this. And she's never known a day where the government and Jesus agreed. Um, the waterline for the gospel has always been above the waterline of the legal system she's in. We've been spoiled for a couple of centuries of having a liberty waterline that's high enough that you can really fulfill everything Jesus calls you to do and never really worry about persecution or prosecution, make it persecuted, but not prosecuted. Right. I'm going to jump there because, again, a lot of people will look at our situation in the United States and they'll say something like, well, yeah, look at the folks over in Malaysia, look at the folks in Syria, look at the folks in other parts of the world. They've got real persecution. So when you're advocating today 
for preserving or protecting religious freedoms. You know, it's self-serving. It gets in the way of the gospel. It's unnecessary. We don't have it that bad. You clearly disagree with that because yep. you've written a number of pieces, and we'll link to them, by the way, at breakpoint.org. I want to link to the various op-eds that Mike uh, Shara has written about this. But that's my first question, is there's a whole lot of people that will t- say, well, this isn't something that's worth fighting about or definitely worth fighting for. You clearly see it differently. I do. I think the utopian hope that we tend to bring is thinking that the tension in our, in our country now is to get to neutral, and it's mm. not, right? So I think if it was about, hey, you're trying to dominate. Like I remember when, when Hobby Lobby was in the Supreme Court years ago about the whole abortive face mandate and such, the Associated Press called me to do a New York Times piece, and they said, Christians, you just want to dominate culture, and you want to impose your morality on us, don't you? And I said, no, actually, I think it's it, not at all that. She said, well, what do you want? I said, listen, the law of the land right now says you can sleep with who you want, love who you want. Unfortunately, the law says you can kill your babies. It is, I don't think I should have to pay for it. I'm just trying to say I don't mandate that a company that doesn't have to pay for diabetes medicine shouldn't be forced to pay for things like abortion that I want to. It's just don't compel us to disagree, to live contrary to our faith. That's what I'm fighting for. And so I think the misnomer is we're trying to dominate culture and impose our religious views versus it's it's really a fight for liberty, the freedom to live it out without being put out of business or put in jail until you can't do that. Yeah. I mean, one of the areas, obviously, where this conflict seems to be the greatest is in what's called SOGI law, sexual orientation, yep. gender identity laws. And there is a, first of all, let's talk a little bit about those. Uh, you also live in San Antonio, which has <laughs> uh, had some interesting stories having to do with Chick-fil-A. But the SOGI laws are things that you've particularly spoken out on. That's a really tough one for a someone who owns a, any sort of business, much less a publicly traded business, to uh, in light of where this is moving. What are the challenges you see, and what are you advocating for in terms of – I don't know if I want to call it a compromise. Is there a compromise available with SOGI laws? Yeah, I think there is, but I think it's somewhat enforced in the law as we have it. Right. So SOGI laws, sexual orientation, gender identity, I think what creates the general public sentiment – is the general belief Americans would have is like, hey, you shouldn't be hated in America. Hey, there shouldn't be discriminatory actions against people. You know, you shouldn't fear risk of your life or your job because of who you are or what God you worship, right? And so I think we'd all go, that's kind of American. Mm-hmm. But social laws don't really address that. They actually begin to make it, um, they create a razor that actually begins to make hatred literally being disagreement. And that's that becomes really dangerous, is if, if disagreement is the equivalence of hate, well, man, America is kind of founded by a bunch of people who disagreed, but said that we should have the freedom to disagree. And that's that whole line of things begins to actually rob rights. You know, when my wife, we had a shooting in Texas this summer, right, in El Paso. Mm-hmm. My wife went to go give blood at a blood bank. She's got the kind of blood people like. And we've come to a place where the poor lab technician who's checking her in has to go, ma'am, I'm sorry, I don't know how to ask this, but like, uh, you checked female. Was that what you were born as by chance? I kind of need to know what you were born born as and she's like what are you saying he's like i'm just we said we're really careful you know to make sure because because literally your biology affects your blood right and he's going i don't want to offend you but is it fair to ask not what you say you are but what the doctor said you were and you're like man what do we come to where a lab tech is fumbling over how to even classify dealing with biological tissue and so so you can open up a whole weird world that um, denies rights in the pursuit of trying to offer freedom and, and dignity, and it actually takes it away. So talk us through the CEOs that you work with. Uh, in, yep. How are SOGI laws impacting them specifically? Sure. So we work with about 1,600 different companies in America, ranging from you know small family businesses to big publicly traded ones. A couple different examples of people don't think about this. Um, here's one of my favorite, like, oh, we haven't thought about this. Like, I flew to D.C., met with the Department of Labor and said, hey, have you guys thought about this? And they literally went, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, so this seems like it'd be a big mess. And they went, yeah, yeah, it would be. So here's an example. We serve 300 women who are CEOs. Many of these have what's called a, a disadvantaged women-owned business. It's a classification that allows them to get government contracts, particularly in industries that are previously very male-dominated. And so it gives them a chance to get those businesses. Well, 
Soji laws could literally opens up the door to be where in a highly competitive industry with very lucrative government contracts, nothing prevents, and there's no way to test this, from a guy choosing to identify as a woman, whether genuinely and authentically, because that is their sexual preference and lifestyle, or not, getting to say, well, I'm now a woman, thus I should get women's business privileges and I should access to minority contracts because I've claimed that. Well, that election is voluntary for that person versus right. the biological reality of the woman who now just loses competitive ability in business contracts. And so when I went to the DOL and said, well, what happens to all these small women owned businesses? They literally went, uh, gosh, we don't, I don't know. There's not really, there's no rules around that. A guy runs a big healthcare data company. He's making medical decisions doing telemedicine based on lab data and pa virtual patient records where you could literally have malpractice and judge a patient with the wrong condition because we thought you were a, a man, but you're actually a woman or vice versa. And I thus make a wrong medical decision, but I'm wrong under SOGI law by making you choose a binary gender, right? So right. You get liability on that side, you got business access, you got um, a local guy runs a health fitness club, a woman identifies a man wants to use the men's locker room. Male customers say, she's in the shower, I'm gonna leave. And he's got a choice of losing his majority customer or being discriminatory against someone who says I want to elect. It's just a whole host of things that really messes with business. Yeah, and it's interesting that we're seeing even, um, and we've talked about this a number of times on Breakpoint, uh, that we're seeing classic feminists, particularly lesbian activists, Mm -hmm. kind of say specifically and you know those that would kind of go on the so part of it resist the gi part of it right the l's yep. kind of resisting the t saying yeah i mean this is kind of unfair we know there's been a um uh you know the, the stories out of connecticut where i think it's yep. 25 or was it 15 or 25 of the last you know of the state championship track in, in track the last two years have been won by biological males mm -hmm. identifying as females and i gotta be honest mike i kind of thought you know years ago that the thing well that would be it right i mean mm -hmm. you know once you start talking about girls in high school sports now you're talking about their dads and their dads aren't going to stand for this and you know i met one of those uh, connecticut girl track athletes and and her mom and her dad you know i don't know the marriage situation but i kind of asked where are the parents on this and everyone's really intimidated. Everyone's kind of really scared to say anything out loud that doesn't go along with, you know, the full new view of tolerance. Are the CEOs you're working with, are they feeling that sort of pressure to stay silent? Oh, absolutely. The pressure is tremendous. I think the false hope, I was talking to a bunch of CEOs recently, and I said, uh, my talk was surely left the building. I said, I think at some point we all were hoping, well, surely when it hits parents, you know, surely when a a little girl gets molested in the men's bathroom or girl's bathroom in a public school like it happened in Georgia. Surely there'll be parent outrage and it'll get corrected. Right. Surely healthcare will happen. You know, there was a case where a, uh, a woman identifies a man went to an ER and because they didn't know it was a woman, the baby that she was carrying died. You know, I was just thinking of that story when you were mentioning the medical malpractice threats and you think, well, yeah. good heavens. And the headline and the article version of that story that I saw basically blamed the hospital Somehow. I mean, it, right. what are they supposed to do? I mean, in other words, blame them for not having an imagination that men could have women and men could have babies. So, so you, I think there's this underlying belief, well, surely when it gets crazy, it'll self-correct. And the reality is it's not. Like I was in Capitol Hill before the Judiciary Committee in April and a Duke medical professor who's pro the XSO side was, but also pro female athletes was just saying, hey, this whole female athletes athletics is a big deal because women literally have a disadvantage physiologically due to testosterone levels in formative ages. And she was given all these charts and graphs of testosterone and formation. And she literally, this will be the death of female sports and athletics and Olympics and scholarships and dot, dot, dot. And the congressman who responded to her said, well, then I think we should let, um, you know, girls need to be allowed to take hormones and steroids then to compete at the level they want. Wow. And the doctor went, I'm sorry, you're not suggesting that we'd have middle school girls take life shortening drugs just to compete because we've allowed gender identity to transform their sports. And he said, I'd rather that than deny someone their right of their identity. And she wow. was like, just flabbergasted. She's like, so Shirley's left the building. So there's no more Shirley. Whoever Shirley was, she stopped <laughs> living in Washington. But like in my own city, when the whole airport municipal drama around putting a Chick-fil-A in, part of what was so scary was I met with our mayor and city council members and literally had city council say, 
well, Chick-fil-A should not be allowed to do business here because they're anti-homosexual. And I said, how? Zero claims, zero stories, zero cases. Well, let's go back. Well, hold on. Don't jump over that too quickly because that's a huge part of the story that many people meet. I mean, I just read the debacle out of Toronto, uh, which yeah. Toronto is trying to, to, you know, to protest this as well. There literally have been zero complaints zero. of discrimination. This goes back to an article – how many years ago now in which the CEO said that he was for biblical marriage? Seven. Seven. Yeah, exactly. So, all, all I said was he was for some. He just said, I'm for biblical marriage, personally. Right. And, and I think, so that's 2012. Uh, you know, that's about the time Obama evolved, right? At that time, wasn't Obama still officially? Second, second term. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyway, carry on. I just, that's an important point. I mean, I think people kind of assume, well, Chick-fil-A is a Christian company, so therefore they, they must have said all these things, and, and they must not hire gay people, and they must have fired people because of sexual orientation or gender identity, and it's actually never happened once. There's a Chick-fil-A near me that's owned by a uh, homosexual man, and 40% of his employees identify as gay. And he would say it's the best company he's ever worked for, best franchise system he's ever been part of. He's experienced nothing but love and respect and dignity from the corporation. So there's zero employee complaints or EOC claims. And so when I asked the city, I said, what's your definition of anti-gay that would make this a hate organization? And initially it was, well, they gave to the Salvation Army, they gave to the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, which I'm like, by the way, so does the local oil company, so does everybody. So if that's the test, like most of the vendors got to leave. What it ultimately came down to, and they finally got honest, they said, when the CEO said he believed in biblical marriage, wow. that was him saying he was against homosexuality, which was a hate statement, which makes it a hate organization, and those kind of businesses should be punished. And I went, whoa, 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 whoa. If saying I believe something is now the definition of violating law, I'm not sure what country we're in anymore. That's a pretty giant leap. Yeah. And so that's the scary thing is when I asked what makes a company pro or, or not be anti-gay, they're using the Human Rights Coalition Cultural Equality Index, which is a crazy thing to go read. And literally the definition is if you're not for it, you're against it. And if you're against it, you're hateful and discriminatory. Right. And there's That's financial the levers. Yeah, and those are just the beginning of the financial levers. We had a webinar uh, several weeks ago with uh, somebody from the National Christian Foundation, from Waterstone, yep. and from the Alliance Defending Freedom to talk about some of the other financial levers and charitable giving. And we'll link to that, by the way, as well. I'm talking with Mike Shero, uh, president and CEO of the C12 Group, and we're talking about religious freedom in the public square as it regards uh, Soji Laws, uh, businessmen who have have uh, classic Christian conviction, come to breakpoint.org. Click on the link on the homepage that says resources mentioned on the radio and podcast, and we'll link you to various op-eds that Mike has written in recent months, being really clear about what religious freedom should be for people in the marketplace. And we'll also link you to where you can also catch this webinar on other financial levers kind of being pulled over this issue right now. Mike, one of the things that you've been really clear on too, and you know I've had this conversation and we've talked about it, we hosted a statement two years ago that was first addressing how accommodating SOGI laws by Christian institutions kind of in an attempt to find a compromise was unwise. And I we stand by that, and there's been a lot more development since then. Um, the Mormon uh, church led a, a something called the Utah Compromise years ago, which has turned out to be nowhere near what it was promised, but that's a model legislation for some in the church who would say that, look, we're going to need to gain some ground. Uh, the SOGI law thing right now is completely all or nothing, and um, we're going to want to carve out some exceptions. And so basically it's an attempt to say, let us discriminate against sexual orientation and gender identity categories in our churches, in our educational institutions, and let us carve out these exemptions ahead of time. I think it's a bad idea for a number of reasons, mainly because I don't think religious freedom just per applies to people that are in pulpits or professors. It's got to apply to professionals. It's got to apply to Jack Phillips and Baron L. Stutzman as much as it does to John Stone Street, right? It's got to. Otherwise, it's not really religious freedom. Secondly, I think that, um, you know, look, their calling 
as a baker, as a florist, your calling in leading this group of uh, businessmen in this organization, the business leaders, the CEOs, the C-level guys that are running companies of all kinds of different stripes. This is the classic Reformed understanding of vocation, that all of our work matters to God, and their conscience matters to God as well. I think when you became a voice on that, and the code name for that compromise, we haven't really seen legislation yet, it's called Fairness for All, you've been super clear, but I think your voice has been really powerful in this as well, because you represent, I think, a group of people that if a fairness for all compromise was achieved, you know, the group you represent, they're going to be on the wrong side of bigotry on day one. Is that right? Yeah, it's hugely short-sighted. I mean, I feel like this is America's equivalent to the 1940s and 30s in Nazi Germany, where, where there's this kind of belief, just keep your head down and it'll blow over. And that this is kind of an appeasement play. Let's just let's just not pick our fight here and we'll go on. If the law gets reconstructed to redefine things like what is a man to be a man or woman and what are the liberties a person has to express their faith, just because you get a, an exception, an exception granted is just as quickly removed. Right. Mm-hmm. So allowing legislation to be put in that changes the constitutional framework of our country and then ride it on a, a, a hall pass is really naive, A, for any institution. B, it really runs against the whole idea of church. If we think the church of Jesus Christ is limited to a set of real estate assets and some employees running institutions, that kind of contradicts what we're preaching people on Sunday. Hmm. And that is to go out and actually be followers of Jesus. And this law really gets in the way of that. So like in our case, you know, I've got 455 companies that employ third party chaplains to come in and serve their employees. Hmm. I've got hundreds of companies that offer marriage resources to help distressed couples, or they offer financial literacy courses. All those things suddenly become acts of hate, right? Suddenly all this ministry stuff gets shut down. We've got, um, you know, if if someone like Dan Cathy is saying, hey, I personally believe is now the definition of hate and oppression and you should be persecuted, you just basically put every faithful Christ follower up on the chopping block and have asked them to compromise to do business in the public square. The stakes are incredibly high. Yeah, I, you know, I appreciate your voice, Mike, not only because you represent so many CEOs, but you were an executive pastor of a church as well. So mm-hmm. you've kind of been on both sides of that. Um, listen, this has been a great conversation. Again, I want to say I appreciate I wanted to chat about your just kind of consistent, faithful stand on this. But I don't, I don't want people to leave not knowing more about C12. I think it's a remarkable organization that helps C-level guys uh, follow Jesus in the marketplace and to do it with the best of their ability, honoring him, not only with their personal private faith, but also how they bring that faith into the public square, how they organize their business, how they train their employees, how they care for their staff, how they build the market that they're involved in. And I know there's folks that listen to the podcast that need to be a part of C12. So here's your elevator pitch, man. Make it good. (laughs) So to everything we've been talking about, I'm fighting for this because I believe that our work matters to God. I believe that if we're following Jesus, that means we've got to be about the business of Jesus. And the marketplace is a phenomenal arena to do that in. So we create business owner roundtable groups, peer advisor groups all around the country where CEOs get together and learn how to build a great business. You know, we're scaling our organizations, multi-billion dollar companies, small family businesses, Mm. but we're doing it in a way that says, how do you honor God? How do you do it in a gospel centered way? And then how do you do eternally significant things through the business? Your business's greatest resource is not your checkbook. It's actually your influence and people and that we're accountable for that. And then the challenge that, you know, John, this is true. Every leader is how do you balance a life in order in the middle of all that? So you're trying to run a business and change the world. But I'm also a son of God. I'm a husband to Jackie, a father to two girls. And man, if I don't have the fruit of the spirit in my life and I don't look and smell like Jesus while I'm telling everyone else to follow him, it's messed up. And so it's a place to try to pull all those three things together. And it's powerful. We're, um, it's a discipleship experience because it's making us wrestle with what does it mean to follow Jesus in everything. You know, I think about um, one friend of mine, he's actually in Colorado right now, ran a, a motorsports company. And tithing, giving, generous testimony, but was realizing, man, my marketing sexualizes women to Mm. sell products. And that's just what my industry does. And you realize, man, the gospel would tell me to, I actually need to express the human dignity of men and women, even the way I market and sell. And so I got to change the way our industry sells product because of the gospel. 
well, that's that's the gospel reforming how he does business, not just what symbols he puts out or what he says, but it's also realizing that 70% of our employees are not going to be churched at all, generously, probably even more than that, but they work 40, 50, 60 hours a week in our places. So how do we let that be a transformative environment? And we're seeing that happen. Which yeah. Is really and really there's cool. such a great history here, isn't there? I mean, you look back mm-hmm. at some of the individuals who made such a remarkable difference for the kingdom. So many of them did it through uh, entrepreneurship, through business, through creativity. And I think it's been one of the great things to see over the last couple of decades mm-hmm. is so many business leaders courageously stand up when it comes to deeply held convictions, you know, take seriously this integration of yeah. their faith into every area of life, saying, how, how would Jesus do business? How would Jesus do marketing? How would Jesus do email? How would Jesus do, you know, healthcare? Mm-hmm. This is all such important stuff, and it's. I think it's really making a difference. And I, I think we can see that. I mean, I, you mentioned, you know, the Hobby Lobby earlier. I mean, I thought it was stunning that, you know, when the evidence came out, is Hobby Lobby really a Christian business? I mean, they could just roll it out, right? I mean, from the way, uh, you know, how much they pay to, you know, the symbolism on the wall in the office to everything. You can just see that the faith makes a big difference to how they, you know, orient their lives and give their money away and manage your company. It's just really stunning. And so may the tribe of those that you influence increase, Mike, and I'm really grateful for what you do. Tell people how to find you online, Twitter, anywhere else. Yeah. Come to C12 group, literally the number, the letter C number 12 group.com. Uh, we're on Twitter at the C12 group. Uh, you can find us on all the social channels and such got great resources and part of what we do is also educate our members on these legalities so adf our friends alliance defending freedom always say being stupid for jesus is still stupid so we try to do a lot of work to help educate that this is what you can do this is how to do it smart this is how to do it effectively man we want to be above reproach one of my favorite examples was we had a guy run a huge company logistics company fired an employee she went to the EOC and says, because I wasn't Christian enough. So the EOC came, did a complete audit of his business. And at the end, the investigator came and said, the only evidence of religious discrimination I found in your company is it sounds like because she was a single mom, you gave her six months more grace than she probably should have gotten. That's the only abuse I saw. And at the end of my interview of all your employees, I wanted to know if you're hiring. (laughs) Like, Like It was just such a great workplace. So my hope is that we create the kind of places where even those who radically disagree with us would say, but that's who I want to work for because I've never been treated better and I can trust the values and compass this place will be operated by, like a Chick-fil-A. Yeah, exactly. Well, what a great story. And that's what we need to see more of. Again, C12 Group, the letter C, the number 12, group.com. Come to breakpoint.org. We'll link you uh, to C12. We'll link you uh, to more on uh, Mike Shera, the president and CEO, our guest today on the Breakpoint podcast, as well as some of the op-eds that he's written recently addressing the religious freedom concerns that we have talked about on the podcast today. And you can uh, be sure to subscribe to the Breakpoint Podcast wherever you get it, iTunes, Spotify, wherever, and rate and review us. That's always helpful for spreading the word to others about what we offer here. Mike, always great to talk to you, my friend, and appreciate your work, praying for you. Thanks for your, uh, your clear and articulate stand for the true and the good and ultimately for Christ. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. You've been listening to Colson Center President John Stone Street and Mike Shero, President and CEO of the C12 Group. Before I leave you today, I wanted to let you know that registration is now open for the 2020 Wilberforce Weekend, the nation's premier annual Christian Worldview Conference. This year's theme, Truth and Love Together. More than ever, our culture needs Christians who understand that to be fully human is to know the truth, love the truth, and live the truth. Wilberforce Weekend 2020 is a rare opportunity to learn from our trademark lineup of transformative speakers, including Oz Guinness, Lee Strobel, and Andy Crouch, and then to connect with hundreds of dynamic people who are living out a Christian worldview in your cities and mission fields with compassion and courage. Wilberforce Weekend 2020 takes place May 14th through 17th at the Gateway Marriott in Arlington, Virginia, right across the river from the nation's capital. And this year, we have special a la carte pricing options in case you can't stay for the whole weekend. It's going to be an incredible event, and I hope to meet you there. Come to WilberforceWeekend.org to register. That's WilberforceWeekend.org. For the Colson Center, I'm Shane Morris.